Everyone, thank you for coming to this uh, parallel discussion session. Uh, what we, my name is Tony Bartlett. I'm the Forestry Research Program Manager for Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. We've got six speakers this afternoon, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of discussion. We originally planned for a two-hour session, now we have 90 minutes, so I've got all of these speakers. Uh, we had a discussion last night to try to shorten the, the talk a bit, so there's discussion. But we will run the six presentations first, and then have discussion. Otherwise, it's very difficult uh, if a lot of questions come on one, one topic only. So just briefly, so that uh, some of you I know understand what ACR is, but uh, ACR has been operating as part of the Australian Aid uh, Initiative for the last 30 years, working on collaborative research in partner countries in the Asia-Pacific region and beyond, but primarily in Asia-Pacific region. The forestry program is one of 14 programs, and we operate in 12 countries, and quite a number of those are in uh, Asia, and some more in the Pacific, and a little bit in Africa. So we, we basically do research in all areas of forestry, and the priorities for the research are determined in consultation with the partner countries. And, and uh, a fair part of what we do focuses on smallholder forestry, but right through the value chain up to policy work. Uh, Jack, you have to turn the next slide, please. You can see there are two results from some of our work, one from Indonesia and one from Vietnam, that show very high cost-benefit ratios from the results of these long-term research collaboration. So that demonstrates very clearly why it's a very good investment uh, to do this type of forest research and how it can pay a lot of dividends uh, to both the economies of those countries and uh, the smallholders. Um, but one important message, and you'll see from the presentations that we have a variety of types of research that we've been supporting, um, that I think is quite important in a conference like this is to understand that there isn't just one area of research that you can do to make all this work, even in the concept of integrated uh, sustainable landscapes. You have to have a lot of different interventions so that you address all the issues. Um, and then, of course, there's the issue of getting the research results out to all of the stakeholders who need to understand it. So I'm not going to take any more time. I'm going to introduce our speakers one by one. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Jim Roshetko from ICRAC. And uh, to save time, I'm not even going to tell you about their backgrounds. I'll just let each of them tell you a little bit about some of the research that they've been involved in. And in some cases, they're also standing in for some other colleagues from other ACR-funded projects just to share the breadth of the research that we've been involved in. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, um, so I'm Jim Roshetko. I work with ECRAF. Um, and I'm going to share uh, some of the activities, uh, the forestry research activities that have occurred in both Indonesia and Vietnam. The Indonesian work uh, I've been involved with personally in the Vietnam uh, work is some of our other colleagues who are up here. Also, we just, just give you a snapshot. I want to make sure that everyone realizes this is not really uh, just an ICRAF set of projects, but there's a bunch of different players and, and stakeholders involved with this research. Okay. Um, so I guess the first thing, and this goes for all the presentations here, is that we've got to remember that the smallholders are key producers of, of timber and non timber forest products. Okay, so <clears throat> timber and non timber forest products are focuses of the ACR research portfolio that Tony just shared with you. Um, so for farmers, Teak trees are more trustworthy than banks. You know? So it's growing on their land, they can harvest it when they want. Okay? They have basically four types of teak growing systems. Some of them might be like a monoculture woodlot. Um, other systems are mixed with fruit species, mixed with other timbers, even to the point of home gardens. So for the most part, farmers prefer the mixed systems because it reduces their risk, they diversify the crop production, uh, products for the farm, um, and it's also very important that they see a sustainable um, environment as being an important thing. So, uh, sustainable um, landscapes, right, as we're talking about at this conference. And the important thing is to remember that uh, they, they go by a, by a Bluetooth system, so they cut the trees when they need them. They're not trying to maximize the, the yield, right, and that's very important. It's their safety. They also know that they need to improve their management. There's some points down there about it. Okay. 
Okay, so the next thing we wanted to look at what are the you know typical farmer subcultural systems? Uh, how do they regenerate their system? How you know how do they manage the trees? And we found out that um, you know that the majority of germplasm on the farm is just what they can get their hands on. They don't think about high quality seedlings or store or seed. All right, if you can see at the bottom, only 12% use improved germplasm. Okay, same thing for pruning. 65% of farmers prune their trees but they prune them to harvest firewood. They don't, they don't prune the branches close to the, um, close to the trunk like they should. They leave stumps which degrade the quality of the timber. Same thing with thinning. 57% of the farmers claim that they thin their teak stands. But in reality, they're harvesting usually the biggest trees. So this is dysgenic uh, process, right? They're actually decreasing the quality of their stand instead of improving it. Um, and in general, they don't manage to improve production, they don't manage to improve growth. So in general, we can say that the, the sort of existing farmer uh, subcultural practices um, uh, lead to a system that's overstocked, slow growing, low quality, and low, produ low productive, right? Uh, we, you know, we discussed this with farmers and the farmers pretty much agreed that, you know, that these are the things that they want to do. So what does that mean? A lot of the uh, a lot of the hybrid acacias comes from uh, cutting cutting hedges. Um, so if the if the age of, if the hedge is very old, the the germplasm that comes from there starts getting old as well. So the growth rate decreases and the form decreases. Um, there's some questions there. The bottom two, those are circled. Those are future research uh, objectives, right? So how can we maximize growth? Key messages, okay. Cutting right to the chase, the last slide. So um, smallholders are key producers of timber and, uh, and uh, non-timber forest products. Um, their systems have very good, they're very sustainable in a landscape sense, in an environmental sense, okay. That's important to remember. Um, they're very good at supporting smallholder livelihoods. They're also very important at producing or, or supporting industrial timber, but also uh, say the macro economy, right? Because they're they're producing cacao, they're producing rubber, they're producing a bunch of other non-timber forest products. So um, we need to have we need to develop a participatory research agenda, which includes farmers' concerns, government concerns, uh, and other stakeholders to address the real needs of the smallholders on the farm, which can guide investment in research and development activities. So thank you very much. Well done. Thanks very much, Jim, and for keeping to time. That's excellent. Okay, the next speaker is Dr. Daniel Mendham from CSIRO. Thanks, Tony. Okay, so uh, following on in the uh, rush theme, uh, given the time cutbacks, just a little bit of background. Um, I'm sure we're all aware that uh, Indonesia and, and a lot of countries, I think most countries in Southeast Asia, have got pretty ambitious plans to increase the, both the area and the productivity of their forest plantations. Uh, and the reasons are pretty clear that uh, forest plantations are good for regional development and wealth creation uh, and also to uh, support the development of sustainable feedstock for uh, downstream processing. And the key to all this is that profitable yields are, you know, essential for, for keeping growers interested in, in growing plantations uh, because there are lots of competing options out there. Uh, and in fact, in some of the research that we've done, we've found that farmers have a, a track record of, of not actually achieving um, optimal yields. So there's, uh, there's some um, communication um, problems there. Okay, thanks, Jack. <clears throat> and... Uh, coming along stream, uh, alongside that, there's uh, some, some key threats to uh, what I'm calling the profitability of short rotation plantations. So there's, there's some biophysical problems, uh, pathogens are becoming um, more prevalent, um, and you know, it looks like uh, uh, some sort of active management strategy is likely to involve a change of species there. Um, again, I've made, made the point there that uh, smallholders uh, have a track record of lower productivity, uh, is that because they uh, have a less intensive management strategy or, or is there a lack of uh, information for them to, to deal with uh, optimising their productivity? And uh, again, they've got alternative land uses which they can uh, adopt if they feel uh, that that would be better suited to their, um, to their 
to their land. And uh, so we really need to provide them with a better uh, value proposition in order for them to grow uh, plantations. So I'm just going to uh, delve into a few snapshots um, based on uh, three projects that I've had a little bit of involvement with. Uh, there are obviously plenty more. Um, Tony gave an overview there, and then there's, there's a, a strong, uh, you know, a strong history of projects with a high benefit cost ratio. So. Uh, I think ACR uh, can be pretty proud of their record there. Next slide, Jack. So, uh, just go back one, yep. Um, is there something missing there, Jack? There should be a table, no, okay. The table hasn't come through uh, in the translation, but um, in some of the work that we've been doing in, in um, Indonesia, it's uh, become pretty clear to us that in fact, wherever you go in the world, that uh, the uh, plantation productivity can vary dr dramatically from site to site, and even within a given site, there can be huge variation in productivity. And if you're a smallholder farmer, you want to know whether your land is capable of growing a, a highly productive plantation or a, a not so highly productive plantation, and, and that will affect your uh, your decision to invest in trees or not. Um, some very interesting work that we've done um, with Mahruf Nuruddin. Um, looking at uh, the relationships between soil characteristics and plantation productivity shows that there are some, uh, there are some sort of key diagnostic indicators of, of plantation productivity that, that we can uh, help farmers to understand the sort of product, productive potential that they may get on their plantations. And you can just imagine that there's a nice table there explaining all those uh, characteristics of sites that are highly productive and sites that are not. Um, typically it's uh, so, soils with uh, sites that have deep soils that, and um, good drainage is critical to uh, to getting highly productive plantations. Uh, moving along to uh, soil log management in Vietnam, another project that uh, that we've been involved in. Um, I think uh, Jim just showed us some of the results from that, but uh, we're really trying to understand the uh, the optimal stocking density and soil nutrition for acacia hybrid production because uh, there's, a, there's a huge demand there for good quality uh, soil logs for the emerging furniture industry that currently has to import a lot of timber. And on the other hand, there's a lot of uh, acacia, plant, acacia hybrid plantations that uh, are growing, but they're not growing, um, they're, they're plant, planted at very high stocking and they're not growing uh, very well for, for producing soil logs. Um, but as that project showed, there's, there's uh, quite a few risks that we need to manage quite, uh, quite intensively. So disease one is one, wind susceptibility is another, and the long rotations also cause problems with, uh, or not problems, they, they uh, play around with the economics so that uh, for farmers it can, be, uh, can cause cash flow problems. Okay, so the third project I'm going to talk about is uh, the sustainability project, and uh, this was. Um, is there one before that, Jack? Or? Yes. Um, this was uh, this study was conducted just recently by Chris Harwood and Sedan and Nambia, and it's a review of the biophysical sustainability of short rotation acacia and eucalypt plantations in Southeast Asia. They went to they visited a heap of uh, com companies and extracted lots of information um, from in Vietnam, Indonesia, China uh, and a few other countries and they looked at uh, whether, the, uh, whether there was any evidence for a problem with uh, sustainability of plantations. Uh, and in fact the, the example here that, that uh, is from Indonesia shows, and this is, this is replicated across the, the data set, it shows that between the first and second rotation that there's, that there's no, uh, no evidence of any decline in productivity. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Jack. Uh, so, yeah, they, they found that there's no evidence of sy systemic sustainability issues um, that uh, in order to, to keep growing productively, growers do have to have an adaptive management style um, so that to overcome disease threats or to, uh, to, to tailor their, their approach, but that's, that's no different to agriculture and agriculture has managed to increase productivity year on year. Um, however, there are still some, some examples of poor practice uh, like site management, soil preparation, 
and uh, weed control, which could be done better. So there are pockets of problems, but but overall, that there's no uh, there's no systemic um, problems with sustainability of these plantations. So moving on to the social science aspects of these projects, um, it's pretty clear that uh, the smallholder farmers are the target beneficiaries, and forestry is a pretty valuable part of the uh, the farm enterprise in a lot of uh, a lot of uh, for a lot of farmers. Um, in Indonesia, a lot of companies uh, have a, a an outgrower scheme, and that can be uh, that can be a very good mechanism to improve the li livelihoods of uh, communities and farmers in in very poorly serviced areas, and and when it works well, it allows for a very short adoption pathway. So that any uh, new technology or new uh, productivity improvements can be easily uh, deployed to the, the farmers. Um, but a lot of the work that we've that we're doing now is finding that there's there's a need for um, probably some improvements to those schemes to, to retain the incentives for farmers to continue to be engaged with the outgrower schemes. Uh, just go back, Jack. What did I miss there? Um, oh, yeah. So social science is, is a pretty important aspect of our projects there in trying to understand how we can best deliver our uh, scientific outputs to farmers. Uh, and the social situation, you know, is, is, is different in almost every situation and location that we come to, so that's something that we've got to deal with as well, that, that variability. Okay, so just in summary, um, these ACR projects that, that, that we've been working on, uh, you know, I think they provide a, a pretty valuable mechanism to both push the frontier of science uh, and also make sure that, that the work that we do is, uh, is of practical benefit to farmers. Um, and, but it's not just the farmers that benefit, there's also lots of other downstream benefits to communities in terms of increased wealth in regional areas. And that's it. Thanks very much, Daniel. Well done. Came in in 30 seconds under, so that's excellent. Set the pace for everyone else. Okay, uh, Dr Didi Rohardi is the next speaker from Forda, uh, seconded to C4. Didi. Thank you, Tony. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, after James and Daniel talk about the production system, the uh, biophysical aspect of the plantations, I'm, I want to bring you to some social aspect and economic uh, point of view of the smallholders' plantations. I think this is the, the main question, is the plantation is an attractive business to farmers, to smallholders? Because this morning our president stated that we have planned 4 billion trees. That's including, I think, planted by smallholders. But again, the question is, are they planted uh, because of they, they believe that it is a good business? Uh, yes, if you are in terms of demand, uh, timber is increasing, while the natural forest production decreasing. There are a lot of potential from smallholders. Also, a lot of support from governments, distributing seedling, for example, establishing nurseries everywhere. And also, it's uh, also uh, very much related with human factors, because people have long experience on cultivating timber in Indonesia, particularly in, in some part in Java. But uh, still we are looking that uh, there are uh, some evidence that uh, smallholders planting with traditional practices, as Jim stated, stated, they are still rely on natural regeneration, for example. They do not really uh, manage this, uh, the plantation for commercial purpose. So I'm looking uh, what are uh, behind this uh, uh, smallholders behavior. Next. Next, so these uh, key findings are mainly based on some uh, completed and ongoing projects, thanks to ACR, who has funded a lot of these activities. First completed project in two, uh, 2012. It is uh, mainly uh, dealing with the civiculture aspect, microfinance, and the marketing. The second one is uh, with different models of uh, uh, community-based commercial uh, plantations. Uh, in particular, the value chains. And also, I took some uh, lessons from, from different uh, case studies. Next. I don't want to uh, talk a bit about the methodology, but of course, you can ask me uh, in the discussions. But first, I would like to draw the, the perspective of smallholders in timber plantations. If we are saying that smallholders planting timber with uh, all of their effort, maybe we have to look at these graphs. And the share contribution 
uh, in terms of incomes from, from timber if joined together. This is the case in Gunung Kidu on uh, thick smallholders plantations. That's about 15% of the uh, income structures. So it tells you something that timber is not the main source of income from a smallholder's point of view. Still, the majority is other non-farm activities. 60% they are uh, generated from labor, uh, go to the cities looking for jobs, etc. And altogether, the farming system is about 40%. That's including food crops. The next, but I, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, it doesn't mean that it is not important because farmers tend to diversify the income. So 15% is high according to farmer structure. Here, uh, the graph how farmers in Gunung Kidu allocate their land. Uh, we can see uh, across the land ownership. So even with smallholder with very small land ownership, they still plan, they still allocate their land for woodlots, for planting timbers. So it means, indicates that planting timbers is also important. As Jim said, it's, it is a saving account for smallholders because when they need money, they can cut the trees. So uh, about 10% of, uh, of the land allocated for planting. Uh, so that's important. The next slide. Uh, we can see from, from, our, uh, from the existing systems, farmers uh, applied the bang butuh. The bang butuh is, uh, yeah, they cut timber when they need money. It's, uh, to some extent, it is good because it's sustained. It's natural selected felling system. But on the other hand, it also weakening the bargaining power of farmers when they are selling timber. Because when they are selling timber, they do not care about the value of the timber itself, but they care about the money that they need for cash. So uh, they tend to become a price taker. And also, you can see from the pictures, uh, they not really much uh, put uh, attention on how to improve the quality. Late pruning, for example, or thinning. It's very difficult to convince farmers uh, to thin. Yeah. Uh, although uh, it could be many reasons. It could be still uh, uh, today knowledge it is not understood or not agree uh, why thin, why should thin the, the timber because they, they have planted in, in uh, uh, difficult effort. So uh, also, uh, smallholders has a lot of uh, constraint from the regulations because they have to uh, get the uh, permits from governments if they want to uh, harvest in some area, particularly in the outside of Java. And they, uh, if they want to transport timber, they also need to, to get the transport documents. So th those are some, some constraints that maybe uh, made or contribute to current behavior of farmers on planting timbers. The next, uh, if we are looking at the value chain analysis from the study, we can see that there are a big difference of uh, price of smallholder timber. For teak, for example, it starts from 500,000 to 5 million, depending on the quality. But most of the smallholders uh, timber lies on the lower price. It's less than 1 million. So it again reflects the lower quality of the timber that uh, produced by smallholders. Next. Uh, if you are looking about the markets, marketing chains, we can see the difference also between the marketing chains in Java, uh, which is have a better infrastructure, and outside Java. Here, for example, in the Gunung Kidu, uh, we have uh, farmers have a lot of options to sell their timber. They have a lot of middlemen in the village. They have a lot of industries that they go uh, to sell their timber. But different, for example, in Sumbawa, they still rely on a few middlemen. So that's again. Be, uh, weakening their bargaining power. Next. So I think uh, there are lots of uh, farmers are rational. So they, they will invest their money in, uh, in, in planting timber if they see the positive response for markets. So if, the, if they see a lot of barriers, then they will allocate their resource to another business. So this is some of the key uh, lessons from, from, from the, our uh, studies. First, I think what we have to do is to improve uh, farmers' market orientations. Even in, 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 uh, in Java, for example, where, where market is uh, more developed, farmers still have to uh, strengthen their orientation, their market orientations. So what we have tried is bring farmers to sawmills. 
saw by themselves about the different price of different uh, qualities. And then they already, uh, it seemed that they already, okay, this is good for them. And then uh, we are trying to, to link between the qualities and the management practice about how, how the impact of pruning, for example, to the quality and then to the price. So those uh, knowledge need to be fed to the to farmers. And again, this, uh, the, the second, uh, I think government need to strengthen, uh, government and also the development agencies need to strengthen the collective marketing. Because currently most of farmers selling timber individually. So from the point of view of economic scale, also it's difficult to, to get uh, more profits. If they can collect, uh, as example in some cases, like in Konami Selatan, uh, they got collected and they get certified and the timber price is increased dramatically. So if we can imitate that kind of uh, uh, mechanism, maybe uh, timber become more uh, lucrative business for smallholders. Things. And in some observations that um, in the project that uh, women has the ability to negotiate the prices and ability to have the collectors come to their homes and take the um, products and sell it to the market. We have the plant uh, oils and also sugar products, um, edible mushrooms, we have um, the vegetable tree, malinjo, we have the forest honey, we have stimulants, potential aphrodisiacs, yes, we do have that. And we also have basket trees for handicrafts. We have dyes and also furniture. And we have also uh, a, a, a range of um, spices, goat meat and milk. We have silk, we have timber, bamboo and aromatics. If you see the products, uh, the pictures of the products from the left, you see the uh, stimulants, you have the... Um, palm sugar in the middle and next to that is the um, briquettes and also the aromatics. The briquettes and aromatics are taken from the middle hills of um, in Nepal. Next. And how do we go about that? How do we actually obtain those? We decided to prov um, think through this um, quite a number of times in uh, previous projects where participatory approach is important, where we do a uh, participatory rapid market appraisal, and it's basically um, designed to analyze uh, the existing value chain from farm gate to consumers and the role of actors in adding value um, and their bargaining power to capture the end user part. And this can subsequently be used to um, raise awareness uh, with farmers about the importance of market information and guide intervention that aims at improving the efficiency of marketing systems and generating benefits from, for participants. Next. And this is actually my last slide. The farmers may be having difficulties in, in actually knowing how to conduct a, a very basic market research. But it's, this comes back to a question whether farmers should be successful being an entrepreneur or just being farmers as cultivators. And one of the things that um, raises within the uh, observations conducted in those projects is that should the farmers need to know how to do market targeting, segmenting and also differentiating? Should they be involved in product development or should they do market testing, as in participatory market testing? And should farmers think about the following questions where, uh, before implementing market development, one is, is my product profitable? Um, will it require the introduction of new or modified products? And This morning you uh, heard that the president mentioned green economy. Also Peter Holmgren mentioned the green economy. economy. But what does it mean by green economy? UNEP uh, defined green economy into three things. First is how to do with the poverty eradication. The second one is, I think is related to you, is sustainable production and also sustainable consumption. Not only to produce, but you guys how to consume the timber, the natural resources. And the third one is uh, protecting and managing natural resources. 
Next please. This is still our president, the president of Indonesia, of course. I think it's, uh, I quoted uh, two years ago. He mentioned that we know the problems. Yeah. We know the problems. Everybody knows the problem. Also, we know the solutions, actually. So, so the president that we uh, saw this morning, no, the solutions. But he mentioned it's difficult to achieve and we must act now. Eh? I think the question is everybody is waiting someone else to solve the problem. So, so and it is, you will be part of the problem, not to be part of the solution. So um, the question is how then research can contribute to the action. And then our term in the ACR, we call it, uh, I'm not mistaken, research for development. In the uh, CGR consortium, we call it research for impact. And in C4 and Forda and IPB call it action research. Action, what we mean by action research is understanding the problem and changing the behavior happen at the same time. Not understanding the problem and then provide recommendation and take five years to change, no. Action research being understanding the problem and changing behavior of the people, of the stakeholders happen at the same time. Time. This is what we call it action reason. And, and why value change? Now we are talking about the value change because a simple globalized trade. So the producer can be in different locations and integrated into a global value change. And you know, linking to global value change can provide opportunity to improve the income. So it's, a, it's very, very nice if you can insert yourself to the global value chains. And also now, today, the SME, even you are small, even you are the producer with only five workers, they are not the local players. They can be a global players. So even they are small, they can be a global players. I saw in Jepara, as a one mother with five workers, they export to Timor-Leste, they export to the Egypt. So you know, even they are small, they can be a global players to insert to the global value chains. Next please. So, so talking about the furniture, this is the, uh, the total trade of uh, wooden furniture is 74 billion. And in ASEAN, there are uh, three big players, Indonesia with 2% of the share, Malaysia, 3%, and Vietnam is the biggest player in Southeast Asia with 5% share of the global uh, wooden furniture trade. It's, it's Jepara, now we talk Jepara. Jepara is the, in the, located in the center of Java with 10% of the Indonesian export coming from Jepara, annually now they export $120 million annually. And comprise uh, 12,000 uh, businesses and proceed 0.9 million cubic meter. And also the economy of furniture in, in Jepara, almost 1 billion, 1 billion. 0.8 billion economy of Jepara, in Jepara. It's, it's about 26% of their economy. And you know, even the decision to buy furniture made by women, as there is here, it's not by men. Yeah. If you guys work together to furniture store with your wife, decision to buy which furniture, even you pay the furniture, still made by women. And also the, the uh, what we call it the uh, value change analysis with survey including a gender study. Next, please. So this, is, this is the result of the uh, furniture value change. He has a small scale producers here that we are concerned. And see, in the top is a market, in the bottom is a wood producer and also farmers. You see why we arrange from top to bottom to down? Because the power of the value chain, any forest product is located at the buyer. It's buyer driven value chain. So if they want to improve their income, there's the small scale producer, they have to move up 
not only becoming, not only become a good furniture producers, but also become sellers, become uh, traders, become retailers, uh, even become a tengkula, brokers, brokers of furniture. This is the only way how to improve their income. So they call it the first scenario, of moving up. The second one is green product. We talk a lot in Chupara about the SVLK, about the certification. So see, the value chain is not only understanding the income distribution, understanding of the power distribution, but how to do it with the value chain, with the existing value chain. See? So that's why in Chupara we develop several scenarios and we act based on that scenario. First we have a moving up, make the local producer as a going to uh, to be a sellers. So the uh, producer in Jepara, they went to New Delhi, to Mumbai, to sell the, their furniture, to participate in the trade exhibition. Also they went to Guangzhou, China, also to sell, to participate in the trade exhibition. So as you know, how they, at the time we there, actually they are producer, but no, they are also good in seller selling their uh, furniture. Two, oh, two. Next, please. So, so the second one was uh, call it the association. How to uh, improve their bargaining power is to associate themselves. And also collaborating down. So we are there, not just talking, but we planted, planted thick there. This uh, June, Jati Unggul Nusantara, two years old of thick with a nine meter height and 10 centimeter diameter. Also, we work together with Pak Bupati to sustain the impact to produce a district regulation. Next, please. This is the main impact. So yes, we have a very, very clear impact that the furniture producer has improved their income. Those who join the association has improved their income. The second one is, this is the certificate of SVLK. Now they produce the green furniture. So you have to buy green furniture by, yeah, to um, participate in the green economy. And also uh, they now be part of decision making process in government. Because they have an association that are very, very strong in the local district. Next one. As lesson to be learned is baseline study as a key to assess the impact, engage stakeholders at the beginning, value chain analysis comprehend the distribution of income and power, action research is the most important, can make difference on the ground, and work at policy level is necessary if you want to sustain the impact. Next, please. This is my last present uh, slide, Tony. We are uh, working on the preliminary study. We are talking a lot about the uh, landscape approach. This is our, our understanding. Landscape, compressed of natural forest, planted forest, agriculture forest, and non-vegetated land. But there is a pressure, of course, from agriculture, planted forest to the natural forest. And the planted forest, they produce something. There is a log flow from uh, planted forest to the industry to the market. It's product flow in the left, but also it's money flow. How to invest actually, how the money coming from selling the timber can be invested in the landscape. So it's very important to do research for the landscape and also investing the landscape based on the money flow, as well as multi-stakeholder approach. So action research is multi-stakeholder approach. And if we understand how the money flow, we can find mechanism to invest the landscape based on the debt money. Okay, thank you. That's all. What can I guess? Thanks, Tony. Uh, from the biophysical and also from the technical part of smallholders practices and also from the marketing and value chains, uh, my works. Uh, 
I'm going to present under the title Understanding Policy Framework to Facilitate Smallholder Productions and Integrated Marketing of Timber and NTFPs in Indonesia. NTFPs uh, stand for Non-Timber Forest Products. And this is the ongoing research as part of the project as uh, mentioned by Aulia, the development of uh, timber and non-timber forest product under integrated production and marketing system. And we just uh, finishing the first year, just finishing uh, the preliminary assessment in the first years, and we are going to start uh, the second year. So this works uh, is conducted by C4. Uh, my name is Ani Adivinata Nawir. I'm part of the forest and livelihood research team in C4. And we have uh, collaborators from WF and also from the district uh, government of Sumbawa and also the university in uh, three uh, research sites. Next. So uh, our study or our research works is actually responding to the underlying reasons uh, that are related to the policy that are constraining uh, smallholders to have more cost-effective productions and also integrated marketing of both timber and non-timber forest products. So within that context, uh, there are two main uh, policy constraints. First, the overly regulated system, and this is because in Indonesia there are the different forest classifications that defining the degree of uh, access uh, to given to the community. And secondly, because there are a lot of overlapping policy and regulation frameworks, particularly produced uh, under the regional autonomy uh, government system. And as part of the work, we map out uh, different policies uh, using these metrics, uh, both for timber and non-timber forest product, if you can see at the left column there. And we map out of the policy uh, across from uh, production system at the farm level management and also at the landscape level. And then after that in the marketing chains as well as in the processing uh, stages. And also uh, you can see within this metric uh, beside identifying policy and legislations at the national level, we also try to understand how is the process in translating this policy into the regulations that are implemented at the local level or at district level. So particularly we are interested why, uh, how uh, the process actually affecting the smallholder practices uh, uh, the, on the ground. Uh, next. So uh, before we start, we kind of try to uh, ident uh, frame ourselves in our analysis. What do we mean by integrated timber and non-timber forest product management? Because that's actually the title of our project and the main goal is to have this uh, more integrated timber and non-timber forest product management. And there are four important components of this uh, integrated management that it enhanced the complementary income portfolio at the household level coming from the optimizations of timber and non-timber forest product production system. And this is supported by more cost-effective value chains. This is the components that my colleague Aulia is leading. And eventually all of these uh, components will improve the management at the landscape level. For all of these components to work, it would, should be facilitated by a favorable, a favorable policy and regulation frameworks. So uh, next. So what do we mean by a favorable policy and regulation framework? So uh, we adopted the definitions that it, it would be the policy instruments that increase the cooperative advantage of small-scale forestry management practices so therefore, it would stimulate investment and its establishment and management of the smallholder uh, practices. So there are three uh, components in the profitable policy and regulation framework that we try to use as the framework in our analysis. That it, the process should be uh, resulted from a participatory process, take into account inputs from stakeholders that are affected in the implementations, and should be tailored to the local context and the last one, because we talk a lot about the transaction costs, so I think there should be a clear in from the beginning before the policy uh, being implemented or being drafted, what will be the benefit and risk that are predicted 
and how manageable uh, these transaction costs can be taken into account in uh, smallholder decisions when they are trying to develop uh, their integrated uh, timber and NTFP uh, management. Next. So uh, in our first year works, we're focusing in the preliminary assessments uh, in mapping out what are the constraints in relation to the policy and uh, regulations. So we kind of highlight that actually the livelihood strategy implemented at the local level is driven by the forestry policy and regulations at the national level and how they have been translated to the local level and affecting their practice uh, in, in, in the forest area. So next. So as part of the policy analysis, because we even start the policy analysis, we have to clearly understand what is the livelihood strategy uh, being implemented by uh, local people. So we try to identify what would be the household income portfolio. This is just uh, give you an example from our two research sites. This is from West Nusa Tenggara and East Nusa Tenggara. Uh, uh, Non-timber forest products are more important than timber in, in their uh, livelihood strategy. And for example, at the first uh, two picture there, you can see even though uh, there is a landscape of community plantations at the backgrounds at the forest, forest edge area next to the rice field. This has not been really optimized in uh, harvest state or in managing for commercial purposes. While the NTFPs are quite advanced. And also uh, in East Nusa Tenggara, it's the similar cases. Even it's more or less intensive than uh, practices in uh, West Nusa Tenggara. So why, why are the reasons behind this? Uh, I can explain in the next uh, slide. So I think this, this slide is quite a bit complicated, so I use a lot of animation. So I would like to ask Jack for helping to do a lot of enter. OK, so basically in West and East Nusa Tenggara, uh, at the bottom there, you can see that people manage their own uh, privately owned lands in the, uh, close to their village. But in their neighboring area, because the villages that we are studying are at the upstream, uh, uh, area, uh, upstream area of the watersheds, and it's kind of uh, important as the water catchment area. So they are neighboring with the protected forests uh, in Sumbawa and our nature reserve in uh, East Nusa Tenggara. So next. So OK. Uh, because of this uh, function of the forest, so the policy is really strictly regulating their access to utilize the forest. So therefore, uh, they have to uh, do a kind of less intensive extractive of non-timber forest products. And importantly, I just want to mention that customary norms and rules are more important in day-to-day -day practices instead of this uh, policy being applied. And next. So uh, from privately owned lands, it's coming uh, from their area is for non-timber forest product that they can uh, plant it. And also uh, uh, limited timber use, as I mentioned earlier. This is because there are two policy being applied. The timber management permits that are derived by the local government and also the mechanism for ver verifying timber legality, that's derived from by the Ministry of Forestry. So those are to apply on the ground. So that's why uh, people are not really, you know, uh, want to harvest timber in that area. Next. And while the focus of this uh, policy are at the management level, so at the transporting and marketing, they are regulated locally based on a national policy. And also it's applied for Next, for the non-timber forest product. Uh, benefited from this panel, and I see so many potential for research area in the future, and also have some comment for some of the uh, speaker. So uh, about the benefit of the smallholder, anybody uh, exploring of about the environmental service from the smallholder? Second one, uh, anybody uh, trying to also get some idea about benefit cost analysis of the smallholder? And the last one, I need also, uh, I mean, I want to make a comparative study with maybe other country with regard to policy of smallholder. I did study in Philippines and Thailand, 
what is very interesting is that there is different regulation about the timber tree depend on species, native species or non-native species. In Thailand, native species are very much regulated because they are also found in state forests. But in, in, so in Thailand, if non-native species, not so much regulation. They are not threatening the state forest. And in I think one of the reasons why they apply the tebang butu, they cut only a few trees for, for they need it, because they are thinking about the environment, so inherently. They are not speaking that I'm environmentalist, but they're keeping, they maintain the environment. Some of the uh, uh, storytelling from, from the farmers, they, they say that now the, the wells are uh, get the waters again, yeah, before it is dried. So I think that's some issue. Uh, the second benefit cost analysis. For smallholders, it is very challenging. I've tried that. I've tried in South Kalimantan, I've tried in Gunung Kidul. And the reason because farmers, it's difficult to, to have a very long time horizon. For growing tick, we need at least 25 years. So there are too much assumptions. Yeah. And in the reality, sometimes uh, farmers are maybe uh, zero income. In fact, they are failing. For example, if the harvest is failed, they, they lost all the money. So instead of, of course, I, I uh, also calculated the, the uh, BCA, and the, the result is, yes, it is feasible in terms of economically, but it's not necessary, uh, I mean, uh, I forgot to mean. It's not uh, necessary competitive to other business.